share screen. Maybe this is not right. Let me see. I change my video to conference cam and then show your face, your faces. And then you should be able to see this. Okay. Hopefully, this will be seen in the recording as well. Okay, let me talk about spin angular momentum and cylindrical vector beam. I like to talk about this because this is recently quite a hot topic to talk about angular momentum of a optical beam. Uh, so there has been quite a bit of research activities in this direction, but just to let you know a little bit about this. The fact that we have seen circular polarization and in the circular polarization, the wave factor actually spins. And you will see that in addition to spinning, it actually has an angular momentum called a spin angular momentum. And how can we see that? Let's assume that uh, I have an optical beam, which is propagating in a Z direction. And then uh, it is polarized um, in the X and Y direction. Let me say the X is here and then y is coming out of the axis. And it is shown that this light beam, this wave actually has a linear momentum, is propagating in this direction. Uh, you can show that it can cause things to move. Okay. So how can we see that? Uh, let's assume that we have a The microphone on the left part maybe it works better. Um, so if you look at this, and then if you express this uh, in cylindrical coordinate, it looks quite different because this is a circular polarization, as we have noticed before. And this is a rotating wave. And it rotates either counterclockwise or clockwise, depending on whether you take the plus. Or the minus sign, as I said before, this rotating wave has angular momentum. Uh, the way to see that is that you write your x hat in cylindrical coordinate system. It will be something like this minus b hat sine phi. And then you can write your y hat in cylindrical coordinate system again. It will be rho hat sine phi plus. B hat cos p. Okay, this is something that you can uh, probably learn from your undergraduate course that if you have an x y coordinate system and then you have x hat and y hat, and then if you have a cylindrical coordinate system with rho hat, and then in the cylindrical coordinate system you have p, and then you have p hat. P hat is pointing in the direction of increasing speed. And if you go out expanding the Cartesian coordinate unit vector in terms of the cylindrical coordinate unit vector to get those two forms. And those are usually discussed in many undergraduate textbooks. So if you plug that in, what happens to the circular polarization is the x hat plus or minus k y hat uh, would look something like rho hat plus or minus i c hat, j c hat, sorry. No, no j there, just 
we have e to the minus of cos j phi. Okay, so what you see is that uh, if you see something like e to the minus j beta z, you know that this is a traveling one. The wave is traveling because the phase is increasing, or in this case, decreasing in the z direction. So if you see something like minus of plus j c, this is also a traveling wave, but this wave is traveling in the angular fashion. If this is p, this wave is either traveling uh, counterclockwise or clockwise. Okay, so you can see that it is something like this, and then you can write e to the j p. And take a different view of uh, viewpoint of it, and that actually is like a traveling wave. If I write it in this manner, rho c the k rho I define to be one over rho. Okay, if you put k rho to be one over rho and plug it in again, you get the left hand side. So this is re written uh, written suggestively, so that you can see that this is the up length. Okay, this is an up length. Yeah, and so e to the minus j c actually corresponds to a wave that travels in the p direction, and it has a wave number k rho. K rho actually becomes very small when rho becomes very large. When the wave wavelength becomes very small, what does it mean? Does the wavelength get bigger or smaller? If you remember your definition of wave number. The wavelength gets bigger or smaller when the wave number becomes small. Inverse, right? It actually becomes this is proportional to two pi over lambda. So as the wave number gets smaller, okay, the wave number wavelengths actually get bigger. So you can imagine that if this is the wave that's traveling in the azimuthal direction, okay, with a constant wave front, you can see that the wavelength actually gets bigger the further away from the origin you move. Okay, so that makes sense. Um, and what is very important is that this wave carries a spin angular Momentum. We'll see in a little while later why it carries a singular uh, uh, spin angular momentum. Um, so, actually, I have this picture over here that I did not use. So, if you break your x hat, y hat into rho hat and c hat, you get the previous equation that you had. Okay. So, in addition to spin angular momentum, okay. You can also have the uh, orbital angular momentum. Orbital ang angular momentum is due to the wave function itself, whereas spin is due to the polarization. So this is polarization. This is due to wave function. Okay, how many of you have had a course in quantum mechanics or something like that? Okay, so when you study quantum mechanics, there are two kinds of angular momentum. One is corresponding to the spin of the electron, and the other one is corresponding to the wave function of the electron. The electron is supposed to move around the nucleus, and that wave function that depicts the motion of the electron gives rise to what we call orbital angular momentum, and similarly. You can think of the wave function associated with electromagnetic wave as having an orbital angular momentum as well. Those are from the wave function. Okay. But we will not belabor this point, but just that these two angular momentum uh, topics that are partly been researched on by many researchers at this point. 
So let's see what kind of things we can do with angular momentum. Um, so people do all kinds of optical engineering where they put a radio analyzer that converts this wave into some kind of a radially polarized wave. And then you have this uh, uh, spectral phase analyzer or something. What this does is that you have this e to the h e j c associated with this wave. This wave, this wave is not equal phase. Okay, depending on where your row is, you have six uh, different phases. So you put this to this uh, uh, spectral uh, phase uh, analyzer, and it makes the thing equal phase. And you put the wave through different polarizers, different um, quarter wave plates, and then you can actually manipulate the polarization and the angular momentum of a light beam. But before we move on, I like to impress you with the fact that a wave has momentum both of the linear side as well as the uh, angular side. So there is something called a momentum density, which we don't have time to go into great detail in this course. It's almost like E cross A, but it's D cross B. Okay, so this thing is called the momentum density. Because it is a momentum density, you can actually study its conservative property by taking the divergence of T. And then ask yourself what this is equal to. It turns out that the algebra is quite complicated. You can actually come up with a conservation theorem for momentum density. It's written out in many textbooks and also in textbooks. You can uh, read up about this, but I will give you a very simplified version of what momentum uh, density is. Okay, so let's assume that we have uh, a very simple case where we just have photons. You can actually derive this expression quite easily. And if I have n photons streaming down like a stream, okay, then I can say that this n photon gives rise to plane waves. And it, as you can see before, you get E like this, and then you have H like this, and this photon is propagating in that direction. Uh, I should have the other thing reverse. I think E should be here. H should be here and then K vector should be there. And this gives rise to photon streaming down the stream. And you can see that the power, the power is E cross H. The instantaneous power should be the energy carried by each photon. I hope you know that it has long discovered that each photon carries an energy, a packet of energy, which is H bar omega. And if I take the photon density to be n, then the amount of energy being carried by n photon is n times h bar omega, but they're traveling at a speed of c. Okay, then the power density is actually c times n times h bar omega. And this thing is actually propagating in a z hat direction. And it has long been known that actually experimentally that the momentum of each photon is h bar k. The energy of each photon is h bar omega. These were all experimentally discovered facts. Okay. The momentum is h bar k, I think is due to the drawing. Energy in h bar omega is due to time. Okay. This has been known experimentally. And so I can take this to knowledge and rewrite this equation so that um, momentum surface somewhat. So there was the omega over K. 
k uh, omega over k is just the c. This is just the velocity of light, the phase velocity. And hence, I can write this as h bar k n c squared c hat. Okay, I hope I get everything correct. But c squared, as you know, is one over mu epsilon. Okay, so I can see that h e bar e cross h is equal to that quantity. And now if I take the mu and epsilon over to the other side, then I get epsilon e for mu h is h bar k n c. And this is just d cross c. And h bar k is the momentum per photon. Okay, so momentum per, per photon and n photon streaming down. This is just momentum density. So this is not a very kosher way of convincing you that the momentum density is d cross d, but at least you know that for you know, streaming photon going down the strain, this momentum is actually given by d cross d. Okay. So any questions regarding this? Yes. Uh, yes. I, I, I guess you probably have seen those gizmo in some people's office where you have a little pen on little thing and one side is dark, the other side is light or gizmo. And that's pink, it's pink, it's pink, it's pink, it's pink, and it flows. That's when the light because the dark side will absorb a photon. The light side will reflect a photon and that separates to the momentum pressure on that star. Uh, uh, on the thing, a little fan, and they keep spinning. I don't have one with me. I can put it just in that somewhere in some offices, and people like to decorate the offices with that device. Have you seen that? Right. If you have, if you have electromagnetic field. Trapped into the cavity that should be pressure yeah. on the cavity wall. Okay, you can explain the pressure this way. They can also use D cross uh, D cross D four. You can think about it. It's very similar to that. Okay, because when you have a cavity wall, you will have electric current flowing on the cavity wall, and those are electrons streaming on the cavity wall, and they have the same way coming in. There is a V cross V force that puts pressure on the cavity. Yeah, you can also think of it this way or, or the other way. Okay. Okay, good. Let's move on. Uh, let's move on to complex pointing theorem. We have talked about instantaneous pointing theorem previously. And in circuit theory, you also know. Two kinds of power definition. One is instantaneous power, the other one is complex power. In circuit theory, you probably learned that if you have a B and then a current I on the load, and that the instantaneous power is given by this. And if you use phasor technique, you know that if you are in the frequency domain. The complex power is given by that. I guess all of you know that from your undergraduate circuit theory course. And we have a similar thing in electromagnetic. We just learned about instantaneous pointing vector, which is given by this quantity over here. Okay, this is called this instantaneous pointing vector. Um, and then we can also define something uh, which is complex. I think we went through that definition before. And if these signals are all time harmonic, we can replace them with phasors, assuming that you have time harmonic signals. Okay, then you can say that, well, 
there is also a phasal representation of that, and then the phasal representation of that. And these are all complex vectors then, very similar to this. Okay. So this would be the phasal representation of the voltage in the current. And you probably learned from your circuit theory that the time average of the instantaneous power is half the real part of V tilde I tilde. You learn from the circuit theory course. Okay. If you go to the same algebra, you can show that if you were to assume that these are time harmonic signal, and if you take the time average of this quantity, okay, which is time bearing, you'll find that this is equal to half the real part of the complex pointing vector. Okay, this is called the complex pointing vector. There should be a complex conjugation here, sorry. Okay, that should be a complex conjugation here. And this can be proved. I'm not going to prove that because it's been proved to you in circuit theory, it has been also proved to you in previous lectures. That the time average of the left hand side is half the real part of the right hand side. Okay, is this okay with you? I won't go to the proof. Uh, but you have to distinguish this. One of the things that students get confused with is the difference between instantaneous power and complex power. On the right hand side, we actually have complex power. The left hand side, there's instantaneous power. The right hand side is called the complex pointing vector. The left hand side is called it. Instantaneous pointing vector. Okay, so so because of this, then uh, I can prove what is called a point, uh, complex pointing theorem. Okay, the complex pointing theorem is the study of this quantity. This quantity would still have the unit of power density. Remember that in phases, the units don't change. Whatever E that I have there, the H that I have there, has the same unit as the Hans domain counterpart. So that quantity has the unit of power density. So why don't I just take the divergence of this quantity? I'm, I'm not going to write the under tilde anymore. And it's implied that these are all complex number okay i'm even going to be more slick and i'm not going to even put the arguments as uh, as uh, a frequency dependent argument it's implied that they are frequency dependent okay so i need to take the divergence of two terms uh, the product of two terms so you can use the product rule for different phases or the product rule for divergence. Actually, it's very similar to the product rule for simple calculus to do in high school. The fact that this product is a cost product, and if you do this correctly, I can tell you the answer. If you don't believe me, you can go and try it out. Okay, this would be equal to h dot curl of e minus e dot curl of h star. Okay, you use the product rule. And one way to remember that, like I find the product rule, when you take the derivative of two terms, you keep one term constant first and then differentiate. And then the next time around, when you come back, you keep the other term a constant and then differentiate. So you end up with having two terms. Okay. And you have to use this, what is called a uh, scalar triple product to manipulate this as well. Okay. 
I don't know why my pen is not writing. Now. Let me try this again. So, does anybody know? Does anyone know why my pen is not writing? Go here. Apparently that one works. Okay. Creeper product. Doesn't work again. It confuses me. How did that just disappear? No, you're right. I don't know why. Okay, just now I didn't write. So this is called the uh, triple product rule that you should know. A dot B cross C is uh, C dot A cross B, which is B dot C cross A. Okay. So now you can substitute in Maxwell's equation for curl of E and curl of A. Okay, substitute in Maxwell's equation for curl of E and curl of H, and that we know what they are. Curl of H star is minus J omega D star plus J star. This star just means complex conjugation. And then um, curl of E is just minus J omega B, okay? And if you substitute in, I'm not going to go through the detail, but that's what you're going to have. You're going to have the fact that uh, divergence of E cross H, which is this quantity I want to find, okay, divergence of E cross H is equal to minus J omega H dot mu dot h star minus e dot epsilon star dot e star. Okay. One thing to notice here is that this sign is negative. Okay, this sign is negative, not positive. Whereas for the instantaneous point in theorem, that sign was a positive sign. So one thing that you have to remember in the complex pointing theorem, you take the difference between the kinetic energy force and the electric energy. So you can still think of the first term as being proportional to the magnetic field energy store. The second term is the electric field energy store. And of course, I have to make use of this uh, relationship, the constitutive relationship that B, okay, B in this equation is mu dot h. And then I have made use of this relationship that the flux is d dot e, okay? And if you make use of this relationship, you end up with that expression, okay? So let's give some physical meaning to this expression. 
and this equation. And this is called the complex pointing theorem. The fact that divergence of this is equal to that. And I actually left out a term. I left out the term that uh, there should be a J somewhere. Okay. So if it's plugged in the J properly, the right hand side should be. Um, Sorry about that. There should be an additional term of minus e dot j star. Okay, that should be there. Okay, so we can look at this pointing theorem and see what happens that if we have no source j equal to zero source free case, and if it's source free case, if you look at this expression again. Okay, if it's the source free case, we can think of a certain volume B, and then there's nothing inside this thing, J being zero. And then if you were to look at E cross H and integrate E cross H over this surface, or E cross H conjugate, which is the complex pointing theorem, essentially I will be integrating this equation over that closed surface. And if the medium is truly lossless, because the integration, if you, I were to integrate this equation, I will get the fact that um, using the Gauss divergence theorem, I will get E cross H conjugate dot Ds, okay, would be equal to minus J omega dB of whatever I have on the right hand side, which is H dot mu dot H star minus E dot epsilon star dot E star. I assume J to be zero. Okay, I would integrate this over B and this over F that is bounding the surface G. And if the medium is truly lossless, and if you remember what this is, Okay, this is complex pointing theorem. And this is complex pointing vector. Okay, complex pointing vector. And if I take the real part of this equation, the left hand side would correspond to the time average power that goes inside the volume B. And if the medium is truly lossless, that time average power should be zero since it does not consume any power. So if they take this real part of this equation, the left hand side should be zero from physical interpretation. Okay. And in order for things to be agreeing with each other, the right hand side must also be zero. Okay, left hand side will be zero for lossless case. Left hand side, right hand side must also be zero. How can I guarantee that the right hand side is zero? I have the omega times some very complicated working form. And if you know your linear algebra, well, this is like a vector times a matrix times the complex conjugation of this vector. Okay, this is like another vector times another matrix times another vector complex conjugation. How can I guarantee that this inner product, a vector times a matrix times a vector, how can I guarantee that number to be a pure real number? Because if that thing is still real, when it takes the right hand side and it's real, oh, it will go to zero. In other words, the right hand side will become pure dimensional. So how can they make those two terms pure real so that when it takes the real part, it is actually a pure imaginary number, it will go to zero. Do you know something from your linear algebra code that if you were to take that part, or how can you make how can you make this quantity pure real? How can I make this quantity pure real? Or how can I make this quantity pure real? Anybody? I 
that you have a course in linear algebra. You have, right? So how would you guarantee that number to be a theory? What is the factor of P about mu and epsilon? Yes? Yeah, but they are complicated and real. They are actually tensors. Tensors mean that they are represented by small matrix, three by three matrix. So real is the correct answer is new and upon our scale. Okay, you have to have an answer. Uh, the method that would be a correct answer if everything is real. It is expression, but we are in the phase of the world. So it can be a complex vector. B can also be a complex vector. So we have to go into the complex vector section. Okay. Yeah, very good. Mu and S1 have the least permission tensor or emission matrices. Okay. So in order to guarantee that the right hand side is still imaginary, you have this requirement that mu is equal to mu conjugate transpose. Epsilon is good at epsilon conjugate transpose. Okay. So it's the permissibility tensor and the permeability tensor have this property. Then the right hand side would be purely inventory and energy conservation is not violated. And that actually denotes the lossless medium. So if we have a lossless medium, right hand side should be purely imaginary and we have. So these two are also called the lossless condition. Actually, you just studied the gyroscopic medium not too long ago. Okay. If you look at the tensor that comes out from the gyroscopic medium, it actually is a permission tensor because we did not put in any law when we derive. The permissibility uh, tensor for gyroscopic means it will actually be permissible. Yes, yes, yes. What is permissible? Oh, okay. Um, conjugate trans, uh, conjugate transport. Okay. So if you take the matrix A, its permission transpose will be like you take the complex conjugate of this and then transport. Okay, it's also right as conjugate transpose. Okay. So I won't prove that. This is usually proved in any uh, linear algebra course that if mu and f1 are Hermitian tensor, those in the product are real. Okay, I can prove it to you, but I don't think I have the time to prove it. So you can read it about the proof in. The lecture notes. So, with the remaining time, uh, I'd like to talk about energy density in dispersive medium. So, we found that when you have a dispersive medium, epsilon is never a constant of frequency, mu is never a constant of frequency from the Group Lorentz Sommerfeld model on a group model. Lorentz model. Okay, because we have equations like Me partial square partial x, where is something like um, maybe the applying force. Um, the minus E E. Okay. So the equation of motion looks something like that. Uh, this is because of Newton's law. Newton's law says that a particle has inertia. So the equation has to look something like this. It means that the relation between x and e is frequency dependent. So the dipole moment, which is dx, which is something proportional to e, and then you will find that p is. Linear, linearly proportional to e, but the kind that we have found has to be a frequency dependent quantity. It's almost impossible to find 
material properties that is frequently independent. It doesn't move this wall. And we're using process of physics to describe that, but that's okay. It's almost impossible to, to do this. So, so I like to talk about energy density in dispersive medium. And you learn that energy density is this in vacuum. Okay, then that you learn in your undergraduate course. These are the energy density in the electric field, and this is the energy density in the magnetic field. And it was not known as to what formula you could use if mu and f1 are the perfect. It was not until 1960 that people came up with the correct formula for energy density. And we try to derive that formula. So in order to derive this formula, I'm going to assume that uh, F1 and mu are dispersive. Okay, as I said before, above there. And then uh, I'm going to assume a quasi time harmonic signal. Okay. But omega is not a real number. Omega has a real part plus a very small imaginary part. So this is not a time harmonic signal anymore, but a quasi time harmonic signal. Very different from what we have done before. And we can do the same thing to the magnetic field. It is going to be quasi time harmonic. Okay, let me call this quasi time harmonic. Okay. And then um, I'm going to plug this expression into Maxwell's equations. Whatever we did for phaser technique still works here. In phaser technique, we assume that omega is real. But here we're going to let omega to be a complex number. It's okay. It still can be used very similar to phaser technique. So what we do then is that uh, we look at E cross H again. Now this is a complex number, okay? This is a complex number. This is a complex number. Okay. Um, I guess it might feel uncomfortable as to why I relate something that is actually real on the left hand side to something that is complex. Okay. It's okay as long as in your mind, you always know that you have to add the complex complication to make it real. Okay, but most of the time people don't bother to add the complex complication So I just say that that signal on the left is a time dependent signal, but it's equal to the right hand side. So the code that you have to add the complex complication part, I'm not going to add that and just assume that you are adding that in your mind. Then, if you plug this signal, this field into Maxwell's equation, uh, you'll find that the divergence of E cross H, okay, which are now complex numbers, uh, would still be equal to the same thing that we had before, except that uh, the identity that we use can still be used, and then you will have E dot gradient of H star. Okay, so far so good. Nothing surprising so far, right? I just feel this identity again, but except now that my E and H are complex numbers. Okay. And then I'm going to use Maxwell's equations to substitute in for those quantities. And you know that if you assume this kind of time dependence, Maxwell's equations simplify to something that looks like phaser technique. Okay, curl of E uh, is going to be equal to minus J omega mu H. Curl of H is J omega epsilon E. Okay, it's a simple fact to show that. But this will still hold true, except 
that we have to know that omega is now a complex number. This is like a phasor technique, but not quite. I'm just using the simplicity of phasor technique to analyze this. And now if I plug this into these two equations, okay, then I can show that um, divergence of E cross H. I'm not going to do the math, okay, but if you go to the math, uh, what you have is that since omega is a complex number, okay, you will find that J omega um, mu of omega, mu is not the tensor, so it makes life a little bit simpler. Plus J omega. I don't have to put this. In. I just did like what I did before, but be mindful that I'm dealing with quantities where omega is a complex number. We okay, will arrive at the same point as before. When you use phasor technique to study complex numbers, okay. We will arrive at the last equation. The difference is that omega is not real anymore. Okay. So, because omega is not real, if you do things correctly, this should be uh, omega complex conjugation over here. Because you have to take the complex conjugation of this equation, so omega will be complex conjugation. But you can work on the details, I'm not going to work on the details, but that is the last equation that we have. And I'm going to do, there's no approximation to the so far. Not a single bit of approximation that you make. The approximation I can do to make sense is to assume that omega is a complex number, but the imaginary part of this omega is very, very small. Okay. I'm going to assume that to be very, very small. And then you can do Taylor series expansion. What you have is that um, what you have is that uh, you you break this into real part and imaginary part and do a Taylor series expansion, do a Taylor series expansion, and then this will have the real part and imaginary part. And then I'm going to assume that omega double prime is going to be very, very small. And if I do that, then with Taylor series expansion, I can show this to be true. Okay, I can show that uh, mu of omega can be written as mu of omega prime minus j omega double prime. And this is simple Taylor series extension will be mu of omega prime minus j omega prime d mu d omega prime. Okay, this is just a simple Taylor series extension. You can do likewise for epsilon of omega. You can reason as uh, this can be thought of as an approximation minus j omega double prime partial. Okay, so I'm going to do this approximation. This is never done in a paper technique before, but I'm going to use this approximation to that equation. That I have on the bottom of all the equations that I have. Okay. And I'm going to then match from. I say that those that are large match to those that are large. Those that are small should be matching with those that are small. That is called power series approximation. One way to say that is that. Um, if you have two power series, a zero x plus a one x square plus a two x cube, and if they are equal to each other, okay, 
Okay, if these two power series are equal to each other for all x, then a zero must be equal to b zero. So that's something you should know in mathematics: a one equals b one, a two equals b two. I'm not going to prove that, but you can prove this very easily. The two power series are equal to each other for all x. The coefficient must be equal. To I can perform series extension of that equation and match terms of the equal order. Okay, and if you do that, then you will show that uh, divergence of E cross H star, which is the largest term on the right hand side, and on the largest term on the left hand side, on the right hand side, if you collect terms, you collect from the last term will be j omega prime mu of omega prime uh, h square. In other words, I take this form, I take this form and keep its largest form. Okay, I can get that on the right hand side. And then I take the other term. Okay, I take this second term and keep this largest term, then I can have two largest terms that I can write down first. And then these two largest terms are just a of j omega prime uh, epsilon complex conjugate omega prime t squared. Okay, I, I have kept the largest form. After I do the power series, now I'm going to write down the next smallest form. Next one that is smaller is going to be proportional to omega double prime. Okay. And if I write that down, the omega double prime term will be this one, mu of omega prime. It's a standard technique used in mathematics. Okay. You do a power series expansion and match terms of the same order. And then there will be a, a, a term that looks like omega prime. Okay. And then you notice that uh, the first one is nothing unusual. You have seen that previous week. Complex point in scale. You take the sign, the difference of the two points, but it's the next two rows that are different. But if you look at the second row, you can actually combine the, the two terms into one derivative. You can also combine the two things into one derivative. And finally, what you have is that um, this thing here actually can be written as minus omega double prime um b omega prime mu okay because you can combine this two into a single derivative and then you can combine that two terms into a single derivative as well popping up I don't want the keyboard. Let me see, not to touch anything unusual. Okay, I have to learn how to write with my thumb, with my palm. Okay, and, and this, this is going to be just that palm, okay? So if I look at this, thing i have something uh that is very interesting the first term that i have in the first row is still in okay and that is just what i know before from the complex points in zero in the second and the third row you can be combined into this very simple formula to scale real now if i take the real part of this equation 
if we take the real part of this equation, the left hand side will be corresponding to complex power or real power. Okay. The time average power of the system. The right hand side, if I take the real part, the first line is a field. Okay, you can see that the first line is a field, and you only pick up the second one if you take the real part of this equation. So what it says is that if I have a quad size time harmonic system, you may take the divergence of this quantity. Divergence of that quantity is proportional to this right hand side. So if I have this thing, the right hand side must be something proportional to energy density, must be proportional to something like this. Okay, must be proportional to something like this. In order for this to count as a conservation theorem, okay, and because of the fact that we have assumed that the time dependence is something like this, and omega is a complex number, if you take this number and square it, it will be proportional to i omega double prime t. Okay, we don't have a truly time harmonic system. So the energy density is actually time bearing. And you can actually see that the last term is actually the time derivative of the total energy stored. Wt, Wt is the energy stored, and it has to be proportional to this thing. This is not one anymore because we have a quad time time harmonic thing. And that actually is proportional to time derivative of that thing. And that thing in the parenthesis and the square bracket at the end must be corresponding to energy density. It must be corresponding to energy density for the perfect moment. And this formula was not discovered but we don't. When I studied group velocity, I thought that something was not right. But when we study power flow, something was not right. We found that we have the correct energy density with this formula for the circuit medium. Okay, it's also written up in in Jackson, but Jackson had a very complicated derivation. I hope this derivation from Herman Howley. Okay, I think this derivation is simple. Okay, I, I give I, I have given the reference in the lecture notes. Any questions before I move on? Okay. If not, then then I'd like to move on to uniqueness theorem. I have only 10 minutes to talk. Maybe I can cover something. So uniqueness theorem is also very interesting. It says that if I give you a problem to solve with two crack forces, and if you solve this problem with the crack boundary conditions, are there only one solution or two solutions that satisfy the equation that I have? It turns out that you have to stipulate the condition under which you get only one solution. Otherwise, you'll be in trouble. And that is uniqueness theorem. Um, so if I have J here, and if I have a PEC, for instance, as a boundary condition, and, and then for PEC, I will have N cross E equal to zero, N cross H is equal to J, Okay, you solve this problem and then you plug in Maxwell's equations in there and you find E and A. You ask the question if I have found a second equation, a solution, is this second solution going to be the same as the first one? So if it is not, then, then it is really bad. I guess if you watch the movie Star Trek, I guess you guys are beyond that generation. In my generation, we watched Star Trek. 
we will say is this a real coin okay i don't know if you use that term anymore but uh, let me prove this uniqueness theorem to you okay so if we have two solutions that are different e a h a and then e b h b let's assume that we have two solutions we don't have a unique solution can this be really true then i can write down maxwell's equation say if i really have two solutions we must satisfy this equation I did not change my source. So my sources will be mi, and then my ha will still be the same. Okay. And I can repeat writing the equation for the second solution, which is very similar. But the source did not change. Okay, the sources did not change. So, so if I were to write down the equation for the second solution, it will look something like this. Okay, agree. So if I do in fact find two possible solutions based on the equation that these two possible solutions have the same, do not change the source. The sources will be subtracted out. You take the first equation, subtract by the third equation, you take the second equation, subtract by the last equation, you will find it different. The difference. Okay, the different solution, which is take this one and then subtract by this one. The difference. Solution will satisfy this equation. And then the difference magnetic field will satisfy this equation. Okay, where delta H and delta E are the different solutions EA minus EB. Delta H is H A minus H B. Okay. Can you see this quite easily? Okay. So if uniqueness is satisfied, then the other H and the other E must be zero. Okay. But let's see when uniqueness will be satisfied. So we again go to the simple algebra. To derive the condition for uniqueness. So we take the divergence of the different solutions. And that will give you using the product rule that we have used so very often. And then I guess we can do this product rule in the script by now. So this is the product rule for taking the dimension of the product, the product of two degrees. And then I can use Maxwell's equations that I had previously from the previous slide for this form and that form. And then um, and then the right hand side will become just J omega delta H star dot mu dot delta h plus j omega delta e dot epsilon star dot delta e very similar to all the kind of negative that we have asked before. Okay. Now we see a divergence. What is your initial reaction now when you see that goes? What is the thing that you see? Wrong, you are wrong, right? Yeah, what, what, what do you see when you see that goes?
we need to create this over a model of V and control outside of the zero. Okay, that is the initial reaction that we will do. So let's integrate this equation over both volume B and impose doubt divergence and arrive at a different expression. So the left hand side would look something like this. Okay. And then the right hand side would be just the volume integral of. Um, J omega delta H star mu delta H. And then plus notice that the signs are different. There's always a minus sign associated with them. That is very peculiar of the complex pointing theorem. Okay. And you, you can again um, ask yourself as to what you can do to make delta E equal to zero, delta H equal to zero, okay? So the next thing you would like to do is actually to make the left hand side equal to zero. The left hand side can become zero if you impose boundary conditions. If you impose boundary conditions on this two solutions that we have Proposed. We have proposed two solutions to Maxwell's equations. But let's assume that when we propose these two solutions, they satisfy the same boundary conditions. Okay. If they satisfy the same boundary conditions, can you see that delta E and delta H, you can use the scalar triplet. Uh, You can, of course, always write this as this and say that this is n cross delta e dot delta h. And you can do likewise and say that this is the same as delta e dot n cross delta h. Okay. So if I have boundary conditions like tangential e equal to zero on the wall of the cavity, the left answer will be zero. And if I have boundary conditions, like if I have tangential H in zero on the cavity wall, the left hand side will also be zero. So we can make the left hand side going to zero by imposing boundary conditions. Would that say a uniqueness problem? If it is it after so I can get this to be zero and then zero equal to the right hand side. Would that Guarantee that the H and the E are zero on the right hand side. Now, what is the E? Okay, fine. Okay, so but the thing that this structure is a minus sign. If you, if you assume that. Um, So that means that if zero, it doesn't mean that each component of the right hand side is individually equal to zero. Even if you assume that mu and f1 are the initial matrix, zero is the minus sign. The transfer is from doing that. Okay, the transfer is from doing that. And hence, you are not telling you to make them unless you do something. Are you? Assume that you have loss in a system. Okay, I don't have much time left. And if you have loss in the system, uh, then left hand side is equal to zero. Right hand side is not the pure inventory number. You have the real part and the inventory part. And you take the inventory part and turn out the minus sign goes away. You see the F1 as complex computation that means the complex computation. So if you take the medium to be lossy, then one of the terms on the right hand side would not have this fine difference. 
and then with that you can go to look so in the medium is wrong here and then you make that discovery I, I guess i'll stop here i'll continue next time do you have any questions any qu yeah you have that one okay Oh yeah, I think uh, I saw that. Yeah, uh, uh, will, will that be will that be a problem? Yeah, that I think we can take care of that. Okay, I right. ask the TA to take care of. It. All right, thank you. So remind much. remind me if it's not been taken care. Of. Okay, because uh, I was the, the on Saturday morning I checked my emails and uh -huh. everything. I freaked out and I thought, oh, what what, what has yeah. happened? So I guess it could be that it's going to be off to the floor. Yeah, yeah. or well, something will like happen. So, all right, but thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. Well, see you on Thursday. Thank you, Professor. Okay, thank you for coming.